Okay. So I was browsing through conservative YouTube today, as I do, making my rounds. And I got to our 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 homie, uh, our our homie. Whoops. I got to our homie, our homie Kirk. <laughs> oh boy, our homie Kirk. <laughs> and I saw this video. Communism always fails for one simple reason. Now, chat, before I even click on this video, what do you think is the first thing I'm going to say here? Chat. What do you think is the very first thing I'm going to say to this video? I want to know if you know. Very first thing I'm going to say. What do you think it is? Could it possibly be that we've never had a communist state before? Could that possibly be what I'm going to talk about? That we've never had communism? Not in this country. Not in another country. The communism has never been tried because you can't have communism when capitalism continuously destroys it. I don't know, but let's take a look and see why, according to Charlie Kirk, communism always fails. I think that communism can be used for the good of society. Hold on. Guys. Bear with me. Well, I'm going to stand up for you. Guys, let him talk. Okay? We talked about but this. Before I ask my question, can you... So I just want to... A few things I want to I take a note about Charlie Kirk's debate style. Now, you could argue, me and, me and Mr. Kirkers have similar debate. Style, not styles, have similar debate platforms. He goes to colleges or he goes to events where he has people come up who are typically unprepared. He typically controls the conversation. You could argue I do this too. There is something to be said when you are in front of a crowd and that crowd turns against you. It is going to make your brain a little flustered. So let's just, let's just see. Maybe Charlie Kirk has a decent argument. Maybe there's a decent argument, and I'm just missing it. You state why um, communism always fails. Okay, yeah, great question. Okay, I reject the question first and foremost. Uh, I'm going to reject the question. Uh, com you can't fail communism if it's not been tried. Something that has not been tried cannot fail. Now, we have a different forms of socialism. We've had Leninism. We've had Stalinism. We've been Maoism. I haven't seen a communist state because that's an oxymoron. You can't have a communist state because the main thing that communism purports is to be anti-state. But I'm sure Charlie Kirk will address this and he won't be bad faith in this question. We'll go, you know what? Let me just correct you there, man. We've never had communism. Um, very simple. Human beings, in my belief and in any sort of observation of human nature, are viciously self-interested and they will not act communally whether given an, ever given an opportunity to do so otherwise so we are not humans won't act communally man i guess the fucking thousands of years of human history where we acted communally just didn't exist I guess, I guess tribal societies never existed, indigenous societies never existed, no society ever existed because we would have had to have worked communally to form any society. Any society functions on communal living. <laughs> Charlie Kirk is not a smart man. Communal social creatures as postulated by either Rousseau or Marx. In fact, we're far more self-interested and sinful in our disposition. And that is why communism has never worked and will never work, unless you have an example you, you could point to. I, I don't. I agree with you, um, which, which is why this comes across as weird. Um, uh, we know that communism fails. Um, and sorry, I'm very bright lights here. Um, uh, uh, we know, we know that communism fails because, um, uh, my God, I'm sorry, I'm just... I'll help you out a little bit. Just, I can, maybe this might help you, okay? It's anti-human. It is anti-family. Remember, Marx talked openly yeah. about destroying the nuclear... Is that helping at all? And here we're getting, into, we're getting into the next bit. Marx didn't make these claims that we needed to... Right? There's always this idea that Marx has talked about, like, the destruction of the nuclear family. No, Marx believed that the nuclear family, as an invention was an invention of capitalism, right? So human society, 
for thousands of years did not exist as a nuclear family, right? If you look at uh, tribal society, typically uh, the child raising was not done by like a wife at home. The child raising was done by the elders in the village. Uh, able-bodied young people went out and, and hunted, gathered, worked, right? So when Marx talks about going back to this, right? He talks about how we can communally raise families together. Now, maybe it's just me, but it takes a village is a phrase for a reason, right? Let's take an, an American example. Uh, let's say I have a cul-de-sac of like four homes and all four of these homes have uh, families that live that are very close, maybe even related. Let's say it's, it's four brothers by four houses. They all live in the houses. They, their grandparents li live with them. So they, they, they build guest suites for their parents. Their parents are constantly watching their kids. They're, they're going to work. Their wives are going to work. This, right, this already is a disruption, of, a disruption of the nuclear family, right? So all, so, and it's, it's interesting to me um, that the right always has this idea of like the nuclear family, the nuclear family, the nuclear family. Um, the nuclear family in regards to like human history I would argue is like the has existed the least, right? In terms of family structures. I mean, the nuclear family is a fairly new in human history creation. Um, so instantly Kirk is being disingenuous. Um, so instantly disingenuous at the very least. Let's keep watching, I guess. Oh, it does. It does. Okay, good. So, so uh, uh, communism fails on uh, uh, when you see someone's business, it, it, uh, all the other businesses that uh, are in that industry stop selling. Um, so if we uh, know that uh, that's going to be the result, why don't we use that, the, the negatives of communism, for good? And what I mean by that is use it for a good that we don't want people to have, uh, specifically drugs. We don't want people to have meth or fentanyl, so why not socialize the drug industry? So the government sees drugs from drug dealers and distributes it to users to force shortages and uh, to basically force a drug famine. That, that is a very interesting idea. Um, so what your idea is, because I want to take every idea seriously, is we nationalize the meth industry and it will be so poorly run, no one will get their meth on time. <laughs> and there'll be like TSA waiting lines to get your meth. They'll be like super bankrupt. They'll like take every possible federal holiday off and people will stop doing meth because the delivery mechanism and the production, they'll be like 10 years delayed in making meth. Uh, is there is there even a response I have to make to this nonsense? If we want to talk about how we, and let me phrase it this way, because I doubt that either Charlie Kirk or this man that's asking the question are asking a question of how do we help addicts? The question is phrased, how do we end the drug? How do we end drug use? On its surface, I think this is a wrong question to ask. I think the question that we're asking should be, how do we help and protect addicts, right? What are things we can do to make it so that people who have a disease, which is addiction, something that's brought about by trauma, something that's brought about by genetics, something that's brought about by life events, how do we protect these people at their core? Now, my stance has always been to decriminalize drugs, right? You can still tackle drugs on, an, on a dealer level, but decriminalize users. We talk a lot on the channel about um, victimless crimes. Drug use is a victimless crime. Plain and simple. The use, the possession and the purchases of, of drugs, the purchase of drugs, so use, possession, purchase, have no victim. There is nobody being harmed besides yourself, but I'm not gonna criminalize someone for harming themselves. There's no one being harmed when you use drugs. 
There's no one being harmed when you um, purchase drugs, and there's no one being harmed when you're holding drugs. Now, you can make an argument that, well, when you use drugs, you may commit X crime, or you may do X thing. But I'm just going to reject this premise and say that we don't punish people for things they have not done yet. Right? I'm just going to reject this premise. Uh, another thing we want to look at when we're talking about helping addicts, again, not what they're talking about, obviously, what I'm talking about, when it comes to helping addicts, is we want to talk about, what about harming yourself? I'm not going to punish someone for harming themselves. I, I'm not criminalizing self-harm, right? I'm not going to criminalize you doing something to yourself. Um, another thing we want to look at when it comes to helping addicts, which we tend to not do, is we want to look at um, we want to look at ways that we can get them help without them fearing, with them fearing that they are going to be punished. So that's a big thing with addicts, right? A lot of addicts won't seek out services because they don't want to get arrested, they don't want to get thrown in jail. I advocate for safe use sites. I think if we, I think that it, an addict is going to use, right? If you have an addict in your family, such as myself, like I have an addict in my family, you understand that addicts are going to find drugs. There is nothing you can do for an addict until they are ready, right? Until they are ready to, to make that change. So they are going to use. It does not matter what you do. It does not matter what laws you put in place. They will find drugs. They will use drugs. So if, if we go in with the understanding that addicts will use, we need places that they can use safely. Addicts are people. Addicts, a lot of addicts are people that went through really fucked up shit or because of drugs have experienced fucked up shit, right? Again, I have addicts in my family. I understand this really fucking well. Safe use sites, a place they can go where there are clean needles a place they can go where they're make, we're making sure they're getting drugs that are not laced with anything. Drugs get laced with fentanyl a lot now, right? Uh, so a place we can make sure that they're not getting laced, a place where they have medical staff on hand if you OD, a place where they have, because um, from my knowledge, a lot of the time on, uh, that there are overdoses is because you don't have medical staff, right? There's nobody to help you right? We can prevent a lot of overdoses by just having medical staff on hand, okay? This is just kind of something we can do. Um, so medical staff, but then also have trained rehabilitation professionals. Have the ability to, if you are there, right? Maybe even it's like you can get the drugs, but you got to sit through 10 minutes, 20 minutes. You got to sit through, you got to sit through a, 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 an AA meeting or an NA meeting, or something. Like, there's, there's stuff we can do. So safe injection sites. I, I don't know that I agree with safe injection kits. I do think that we want to keep uh, people in one spot so we know that they're safe. But a place where they can go where there's not violence, there's not um, risk of harm, they don't have to risk sexual harm to get the drugs, right? I, I totally totally understand that when we hear this idea of drugs we have an instant impulsive response right and i would argue this this response our intuition around drugs right i feel like we all have this intuitive response originally with drugs is like no they're addicts they're bad people this is built upon you via 80s and 90s anti-drug campaigns this is not the reality of addiction are people who use drugs more prone to violence yeah just like people who, who drink alcohol, <laughs> you, you might be a little more prone to be violent. Are, are these people a danger to society? No, they need help. So I know that Kirk probably doesn't care. I know that this, the person he's talking to probably doesn't care. And I know I just went on a long tirade. But these are kind of things that we need in society if we want to help addiction. We can talk later about how we also want to, how poverty will address addiction, but that's a whole nother ballpark and people will just give it up. Uh, basically, yes. They, That's actually kind of smart. Uh, the meth store's only open four hours a day. Everyone's super angry when you walk in. 
You might be onto something. I'm not even being sarcastic. I, th you know? I, I think that I think that users would be more than willing to turn in their dealers, and um, uh, once dealers realize that they can't they can't sell drugs because they'll be seized and distributed, that's sort of the end of the drug market. Hey, I mean, why would users turn in their dealers if the system you're proposing is working worse? If they can't get the drugs, why would they turn in the people that can give them the drugs? This is such a dumb idea. You got me at trying to make the meth stores like the TSA. So uh, <laughs> God bless. Thank you. I don't know. I'd argue the TSA is working. Like, we may all hate the TSA. We may all hate it. it the, it's doing its job. Right? When's the last time we had a, a terrorist attack on an airplane? <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? I want to see this one. So this one is crazy race debate results in students storming off. I'm sure Charlie Kirk has a super nuanced take on race. All right, so I've been watching this for some 20 odd years. You know, just. Oh, ma'am, you've been doing it forever. Welcome to the First Amendment. Just, I fought sir, for it. Can you, you just stay focused on me? Your pay jacket? Sir, thank just, you. I brought it overseas. All right, sir, just, just ask me the question. Why do we need the Gish Gala? Well, it's for views. He needs, he needs the nonsense at the beginning for views. So what is it about conservatives and this whole racism thing? Like you guys are always just saying that it's either not a thing or it's, you know, just not in any of the institutions or the police department. But it seems that over the past 18 years, we've had several race riots and the biggest one being in 2020. So it's like, how are we still denying segregation in a city where we can clearly see what fucking neighborhoods are white, which ones are black, which ones are Latino, and we know how we got there. So it's like, what is it with conservatives and admitting that there's a problem and not addressing it? Because it seems like you guys want to be obsessed with, oh, the gender thing or the racism thing. And then you guys say, oh, it's not here. It's not a big problem. But why are millions of people rioting every couple of years? So let me ask you a question. We can say that it's Democrats yeah. and shit, right? Well, let no, me no, ask okay, you a question. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So do you th what do you think is a bigger problem facing America? Single fatherhood or racism? Racism. Oh, here we by go. By far. That's can how can you we say that to... say that in the microphone? Here we go. Racism, by far, because racism gets people killed, not single fatherhood. Well, no, a single motherhood. Let me be more specific. So so single moms or fathers leaving the home, you think is a bigger problem than racism. No, sir, sir, sir. You're gonna have I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat that one again for you. I think racism is a bigger problem than fathers being outside of the home. However, I do see fathers not being so, in so, the home so, so, is a problem. Let, let's make sure we're defining our- We're gonna pull this nonsense again. Oh my God, it's just so... The single fatherhood rate, <laughs> the single fatherhood nonsense, it's just, it's just so stupid. It's so dumb. It's not about fathers being out of the home. It's about homes having access to money it's about poverty i can't believe this talking point is not debunked more often it blows my mind right i will hear him talk and then i'll i'll just go through all the nonsense that he says our terms how would you define racism then racism is a system of oppression used by uh used by a certain group using prejudice, institutional power it. and it's situated by the media government and all these so other give me an example of one nice definition thing you as a black man cannot do that I as a white man can do. He instantly didn't listen. He didn't listen to the man's answer. He didn't listen to the man's answer. Do in America. Got you. Okay, so about two weeks ago, right? I went to a DeSantis rally. Got my ticket, all that good bullshit. Been to a million different, you know, rallies of a kind, whether, you know, I was a conservative at the time or whether I was a liberal, right? I know that as a black person, I am far more likely to be arrested for expressing my view, whether I am a conservative or a liberal. And I've done it on both sides. And, oh yes, I was, I was well, arrested. But you were probably being a and jerk, that's, that's oh, why you were arrested. Oh, actually, and that's the best the part, and that's the best did. part, right? That's the best Okay, so there's a few, there's a few issues that we have, have here, right? First and foremost, when we talk about, oh my God, I, this is my issue with Charlie Kirk is he frames his questions in the way that the listeners don't realize is a disingenuous phrasing of the question. 
First and foremost, when we talk about racism, especially systemic racism and racism on a, an institutional level, it's not about what can one person do over another, right? I would argue that there are still some issues with, with uh, equality of, um, um, or what's, the, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Um, your access to like the means of success. Okay, I had to phrase it in a weird way because I can't think of the word I'm looking for. But there is a there is a phrase that talks about what I'm saying, right? Your access to the means of success. Okay, so we can look at uh, opportunity. Fucking thank you, ghost. Why can I not think of the word opportunity? Equality of opportunity. So equality of opportunity is the word that I was looking for. And just opportunity escaped me. So equality of opportunity. We can we can analyze this on a really deep on a really deep level. We can analyze this by looking at school funding. We can analyze this by looking at the fact that schools that have more black students tend to be funded less, right? We can analyze this when we look at how uh, property tax funds school and how black people were shoveled into neighborhoods with lowered and lowered property tax. Therefore, the funding of their education, like it's all a history thing that just goes back and back in a dominoes to modern modern day right so when we look at these issues when we look at these these issues and charlie kirk says well what can i do that you can't do well that's not the question right the question is is there equity in these outcomes are are there disproportionate effects in our current system that black people face that white people don't there's a lot of instances we can look at for this too, by the way. For instance, white people arrested for more drug-related crime. Black people make up the bulk of people in prisons for drug-related crime. And even when we look at the U.S. Sentencing Bureau, the U.S. Sentencing Bureau quite literally uh, makes mention on their website about the disproportionate effects that black people face in our criminal justice system, right? Black men, okay, receive prison sentences that are 13.4% longer than their counterparts. 13.4% longer, okay? And even when we account for, like, first-time crime, and even when we account for the socioeconomic conditions, right? Socioeconomic conditions in which... um these people come from, these, these disproportionate outcomes still exist. Why? Why would these disproportionate outcomes exist if there's no racism? Now, oftentimes what I'll be told is, well, maybe it's just racist judges. My answer to this is, okay, so we exist in a system that perpetuates racism by allowing racist judges to maintain political power. Or I guess you would call this not political power because they're judges, you would call it um, uh, institutional power. Judicial power, yeah, we can say judicial power as well. The other thing you want to look at is we can look at the Veil of Darkness study. Now, I bring the Veil of Darkness study up a lot, right? Because the Veil of Darkness study is, in my opinion, right, one of the most thorough studies to analyze disproportionality between black and white people that I've ever read, okay? If you are unaware of the Veil of Darkness study, let me bring up um, the study to give you guys some examples. So between 2011 and 2018, they, this is Stanford. Stanford analyzed 21 state patrol agencies in 35 municipalities across the United States. They analyzed 95 million traffic stops, okay? Now, what did they, how did they do this study? Let's analyze the study so that you guys have some information for when you are, you are going into your, your debates. What they did is they said, okay, let's take specific areas of the country and let's say it's five o'clock. Now let's analyze this area where we see a high concentration of traffic stops and let's analyze those stops at five o'clock and see who gets pulled over more black people or white people. Now let's take that same stop at a different time of the year when it's now dark outside. So they take the stop when it was light, stop when it was dark. And they said, let's see if anything changes. And what they found 
was that black drivers are less likely to be pulled over at night when it's harder to see the race of the person driving their car. That's why they call it the veil of darkness. That veil of darkness masks their race. Now, I propose to you. Before I propose this question, let me just, re let me just reiterate. They accounted for the reason of stops. They accounted for, pop they accounted for e everything you could want accounted for in this study was accounted for, right? So that they got pure analytic data. Now, my, my proposed question is if there is no racism on either a systemic or um, on either a systemic or individual basis, if racism is not affecting different population groups differently, why is there, why is there a disparity in the traffic stops? I'll give chat a chance to answer. Go ahead, chat. If it's not racism, what could it be? Pixie magic? Imagination? A witch's brew, perhaps? Or is it just that we have formulated a criminal justice system in which we allow police bias on race to infiltrate and harm? Could this be the, could this be the reason? Just a thought. Just a thought. Now, do you think Charlie Kirk is ever going to talk about this? Do you think he's ever going to mention? Do you think Charlie Kirk's even read this study? Probably not. Probably not. But I just wanted to give you, chat, some information so that you can go forth with this if you're ever in a conversation with somebody. Best part. I wasn't even being a jerk. And the courts even okay, found so, our well, beloved let me, courts. Let me make sure I understand this. So you them. think the bigger problem than fathers not being in the home is a abstract conspiracy theory that you have that hecklers and jerks at political events are arrested because of the color of their skin? That, that's, your, that's the best definition I'm of saying, institutional racism. No, that's, that's not my definition on racism. Well, I did no, tell give you me what an my example of something a white man like me can do that a black man like you can't do. Because guess oh, what? For one, if I showed for up one, at a DeSantis sure, event and started heckling, sure. I'd be kicked out and arrested. No, you would not. No, you, in well, fact, I even have evidence. You know how of that. I know that's true? You Most know, of the well, do you want to know how I know white it's true? suburban kids yeah, from Highland Park and they're arrested a lot more. Yeah, he's done a little reverse of reverse here. Instead of engaging, which we knew was happening, instead of Charlie Kirk engaging in the conversation on racism and whether racism is institutional, whether racism is systemic, whatever, whatever, he keeps falling back on this question. What can I do that you can't do? Now, you could easily make the argument you could probably get through the criminal justice system with less hardship than me, right? You could make the argument, you might have had a better education than me. Like if we're gonna just look at uh, the, the numbers, right? There is a, there's something to be said that you may have, like typically you may have had a better education. You typically may have had a more, um, uh, a more stable environment in which you were raised around. And by this, I mean like area wise, right? I don't mean like in the home. I mean like the environment or surrounding your home might have been better, right? There's a lot of things you could say, but again, he's just avoiding the actual conversation. And this is why I need people when we talk about like white privilege and when we talk about things like this, okay? We need people to stop going in and going, well, this is my individual, I, I, I hate when we talk about individual experience in these conversations. I think if you're outside of a debate, I, I would love to hear about your individual experience regarding racism, the things that you've experienced, all of this. But when we're having this conversation, we need to be very specific, talking about the numbers, talking about the disproportionate outcomes between these two racial groups, and talking about how those disproportionate outcomes came into play. Char Char is not doing any of this. Char Char is just falling back on this simple question because he knows that this question is going to mean that you have to now talk about your personal experience, which can never be verified on a debate level. So if somebody asks you this question, just say, I reject this question. I reject the premise of this question. This question does not 
address my argument. This question does not even come close to coming near my argument. My argument is in Washington, D.C. This question is in China. Actually, when you see the mug shots. Yeah. Oh, so white kids are arrested a lot more. Could well, that possibly be? Could that possibly be? Can you talk be? into the mic? Not, and, I'm, and, I'm just, and I'm just guessing here. Could it possibly be that white people are arrested more because you have a higher population and therefore by proximity you are more like, because it's math. It's basic math. I know we hate math. I know we hate it, but I passed well, okay. it, unlike y'all. So <laughs> let, let me ask you a question. How does racism contribute to black on black crime in Chicago? How is oh, white people to blame for that? So here we have another, we have another pivot. Okay. We have another pivot. So there's a few things we can look at here. Black on black crime is a myth. Okay. Black on black crime does not exist. And when I say this, here's what I mean. We don't call it white on white crime. We don't call it Spanish, Hispanic on Hispanic crime. The only reason to call it black on black is to signify a dog whistle, right? You're, you're whistling to the dogs with black on black, right? People commit crime towards the people that they have a proximity. Charlie's guest said this. He said, could it be that white people commit more crime because there's more white people and they're in high proximity to other white people? When you look at the rate of crimes committed against communities, black people and white people commit the same rates of crime against their people, right? The rates are the same. So white people are committing around the same amount of crime against other white people as black people are committing against other black people. Charlie Kirk doesn't want to talk about this, though. Why would he want to talk about this, right? Because it just de destroys the narrative. They only want to talk about black on black as a dog whistle. Now, let's analyze crime in black communities. Could it be possible just to... Run, run with me on this one, squad. Could it be a possibility that when you have an intercity area where that you have forced people into in large concentration, so you've taken a lot of people and you force them into these smaller areas, and then you defund their homes, you lower their taxes, you defund their schools, you introduce drugs to the area, <clears throat> CIA, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan. You, you systematically put laws against them, Jim Crow. You make it so that they can't hold the same type of jobs as you. Could it be that when all of these things are pushed and pressed together, that what you're creating, right, is almost like a ticking time bomb and eventually it will explode into crime because say it with me poverty plus proximity equals crime so when you have a lot of people in a small area that you've systemically kept poor what will happen Crime. So when Charlie Kirk talks about black on black crime, all he's doing is dog whistling. They don't actually care about black on black crime because if they did, they would care about fixing the issues in these inner city communities. They don't. It is just a pivot away from the conversation that the person was trying to have with him, which was, why don't we talk about the fact that white people, the majority of the population are committing the bulk of the crime? and how it's about just sheer volume. But and then Charlie Kirk decided to pivot. Oh, actually, matter of fact, that's actually a whole other issue. So let's talk about, so you wanna talk about intracommunal violence as it pertains yeah, to Yeah, so what, what does the white man have to do with so, that? Oh, and that's a great thing. I love the red herring that you threw in there. No, it's, yes, it's, because, it's a, hey, it's a hey, intracommunal violence is proximal, right? So when we have segregation and we got races sitting in one area, and you got another race in another area. Now, we never ask white people, why is white, uh, white on white crime so high with white people? And never, uh, ins but instead we focus on black people. Yeah, so out of the 530 murders in Chicago of the last year, how many mm -hmm. were black on black crime? Hey, I wasn't looking. 
but out of the out of the hundreds of murders of white people in the last year, how many was white on white crime? This is such a dumb question. It is such a stupid question. Rates of white on white and black on black homicide are similar at around 80 percent and 90 percent. So overall, most homicides in the United States are interracial and the rates of white on white and black on black killings are similar both long term and in individual years. Between 1980 and 2008, the U.S. Department of Justice found that 84% of white victims were killed by white offenders, and 93% of black victims were killed by black offenders. 2018, the Federal Bureau of Investigation reported that 81% of white victims were killed by white offenders, and 89% of black victims were killed by black offenders. In 2017, the FBI reported almost identical figures, 80% of white victims were killed by white offenders, and 88% of black victims were killed by black offenders. So... Per all of the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the U.S. Department of Justice, and the FBI, which is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but in separate years. So 2017, 2018, and then 1980 to 2008. The numbers are relatively the same. So when he goes, what's the percentage of blacks killing blacks in Chicago? What's the percentage of whites killing whites in Chicago? Probably around the same percentage. Per capita, right? I'm sure Charlie Kirk knows how to use per capita. So again, dog whistle. Charlie Kirk is disingenuous. He is asking disingenuous questions because he knows his base won't look up any of the actual facts. His, his viewers aren't going to look up what's actually fucking happening. But you know what I yeah, do know? Well well, you know 420 hey. of them were black on black sure, gang related sure, crimes. Sure. How is that? Sure. What's the population of black people in Chicago, Charlie? What's the population of black people in Chicago? Is this a joke? Yeah, it's 36.1% white and 28.5% black. There's a lot of black people in Chicago. What does this have to do with anything? Racism to blame for that. Let's talk. Yes, so yes. And I explained why. I already explained why in this video. But yes, you can blame systemic racism for the crime rate in intercities because of the, the hundreds of years. You think that the, the uh, what is it? 30s to the 70s of on the books redlining and then the the 70s to to now of the off the books redlining doesn't have something to do with the crime rates you think that the constant over policing of these areas don't have something to do with the crime rates you think that the constant defunding of these schools don't have to do with the crime rates you think that constantly throwing black men in jail for trumped up drug drug charges because fucking ronald reagan wanted to get his nuts off with 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 the war on drugs don't have something to do with the crime rates It's so, it's so nonsense. Now, are we going to talk about over-policing? I'm sorry, sir. You're kind of would demonstrating. You, like to, you can't answer would you, the would you Would you like to talk about, I mean, you, we can not talk about it. We can. Okay. Are you ready to address it? It's a disingenuous question. So, well, are you ready to address it? Yeah. Yeah. Because we can talk about, because we can talk about black on black crime, but we need to talk about it as it pertains, we need to, Okay, let's talk about it, sis. We, we, I'm ready to talk about it. All right, hold on. So I'm ready to talk just, about it. Let me just I'm narrow this down. So let me just, let me just say this, all okay? Right, all right. So Stop. if you were to rank the 100 biggest problems in America, yeah. the fact that I know we're not a racist country is the best example you have. Is okay, some so, so you know we're not a racist country based on what? story of you getting kicked out of a DeSantis what? rally. If we were a racist country, you'd no. say, Charlie, I can't go in a convenience store. Charlie, I can't go into school. No, we actually live in such a li a amazingly so not, decent country that, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't. Let's not let's not do that, okay? All I did was speak. All I did was speak. All I did was no, speak. you're trying to pull out. Oh, no. Mostly peaceful, everybody. Mostly peaceful, I okay? I didn't lay hands on you. I didn't lay hands on All you. Right. I got witnesses. I did not touch you. Yeah. No. All right. I touched the mic. We're gonna wrap this one Don't up. Play. But let me just let anyway. me just say this. We got racism in we we got racism all over the U.S. We just had a race riot two three years okay, ago. Okay, so let's in talk 2020. About, wait, hold and, on. So, oh my God! And then we had all 50 states plus 18 countries. But don't worry, I'll wait. Right. So by I'm race riots, you mean them. you mean I mass to looting of big screen TVs? Works. Let let me tell you. It is not an argument in your favor that we're a racist country because blacks decide decide to start burning down Wendy's and stealing stuff. That's called Actually, criminality. I mean, he says blacks. Is there anything else I have to do? I even have to to go into this. He he uses the phrase blacks all the time. Do I even need to? Do I need to say more?
It is, is because you're not even, you're not even looking as to why it happened. You're not even looking as to why it happened. And that's cool. And that's cool. You know, we can definitely play, uh, you know, obtuse on the whole issue. Yeah, black people were burning it down. Why? Racism. Racism was a big issue. And we can pretend that it's not a big issue. But hey, yeah. hey, if, if you don't want to, then that's just called being obtuse. And that's why I asked you. And that's why I asked you. Why did you have such a big problem with talking about racism? You want well, to claim that it's not there. And you can say all, right. all you want. So, but that still I, doesn't prove. That I, still, that I, still, that still does conclude. not. If you want to talk about racism that could be proven, rights, proven so let me, let me give you so. some examples of racism that could be proven. How about affirmative action at this college that discriminates against Asian students and whites? Notice. Notice, do you guys notice how we're not a racist country? There's no racism until they need to use it against uh, the left. Then all of a sudden, racism exists. All of a sudden, racism exists at that point. There is no racism till I need to use it to win my argument. Then all of a sudden, racism exists. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. I think I provided plenty of facts, uh, plenty of facts in, in the last 40 minutes that shows that Charlie Kirk doesn't really know what he's talking about and that he specifically, specifically, uh, <laughs> will, will mislead, misdirect, and be disingenuous. That's our Charlie Kirk time for today. Maybe we'll come back in a couple weeks and do another checkup on old Kirkers. Uh, it, honestly, it makes me not ever want to buy Kirkland products. I know it's got nothing to do with them, but just the association of the name. <laughs> the association of the name, bro. Anyway.